Hi, everybody. Welcome into Sports Talk Chicago. Great to see all of you here with us from our beautiful Chicago Land Studios. John Meadows directing and producing here tonight. With us today, we have a very special guest, sports reporter at ABC7, host of Give Me the Hot Sauce, and also the TV voice of the Windy City Bulls. Please welcome good friend of the program, Mark Shanowski. Mark, it's great to see you. How are you doing? Doing great, John. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you here. Um, what do you make of this entire Bulls season, especially last night with Zach Levine's comments saying that the Hawks wanted it more in a pretty pivotal game down the stretch? Yeah, that's quite an indictment in Game 79 when you say the other team just <laughs> wanted it more, especially considering the fact that the Hawks' best player, Trey Young, sat out because of illness. And you figured the Bulls were at home coming off a good win over Memphis on Sunday and with a chance to move up in the standings. Had they beaten the Hawks, they would have moved into a tie with Atlanta, would have had the tiebreaker if they finished with the same record. They had a lot to play for, and yet they came out flat. They were down 13-2. to two. They spent the rest of the night trying to catch up and they never really could. Uh, you know, a very similar storyline to what we've seen in a lot of the losses this year. The Bulls could not make any three-point shots, and their opponents could, and that was a big difference in the game. What's wrong with this team, Mark? <laughs> well, i tell you what. It's, it's been different stories from night to night. Some nights they don't protect the ball. Some nights they struggle to rebound. But I think the biggest stat that really has stood out all season long is the one I mentioned earlier. They are last in the NBA in three-point attempts and near the bottom in three-point makes. And like it or not, the NBA has become a three-point shooting league. And AK and his staff knew that going into the offseason, that the, one of the areas they needed to address was to improve their three-point shooting ability. They chose not to do that, and that's really hurt them this season. DeMar DeRozan has had a good season, certainly not up to a second-team All-NBA like he had a year ago. Zach Levine has come on really strong in the latter two-thirds of the season, but yet they don't have that supporting cast that could give them the three-point shooting that would really open up driving lanes for Levine and DeRozan. And a lot of nights, they just struggle to score. Why do you think they refuse to address that sort of situation, both in the offseason and then at the trade deadline just a few weeks ago? Well, this is something Bulls fans really don't like to hear, but the reality of it is that Jerry Reinsdorf has always been consistent in saying that he will not go into the luxury tax unless he feels like he has a team that can compete for a championship. I think in the estimation of the two Reinsdorfs, Jerry and Michael, who runs the Bulls franchise now, and the front office, they felt, felt like they were not a team that was capable of going deep into the Eastern Conference playoffs. And by virtue of that, they didn't go out at the trade deadline and try to extend themselves and maybe bring in a couple of shooters that could have helped them over the final third of the season. They're going to have to take a hard look at the roster during the summer and decide what their priorities are going to be. But again, they're going to be squeezed up against that three, that luxury tax line, and they're going to have to decide whether or not they're going to go beyond that to try to make a team that can not only qualify for the playoffs, but maybe compete against some of the heavyweights in the Eastern Conference. I'll tell you what sticks out to me right there is that they're near the luxury tax threshold, and they're barely getting into the play-in game, let alone the actual first six seeds. That's a problem, right, Mark? Yeah, and I think the roster was constructed with the idea that there would be some internal improvement from guys like Patrick Williams and Kobe White, and that would maybe help fill in some of the gaps that they have in terms of their offense. It really hasn't worked out the way that they had hoped. Kobe White has shown some signs lately that, that he could be a, a very useful rotation player in the league. Patrick Williams has been up and down, kind of like the Bulls. Some nights he looks really good. Other nights you barely notice that he's out there. They do have to take a hard look at the roster Nikola Vucevic will be a free agent this summer. Kobe White and Ayo Sumu will also be free agents, although both are, are restricted. And they're going to have to make a decision on, on, on who they want to keep and what ways they can use to try to improve the roster. There's going to be changes to the roster. I think that more than likely they're going to decide to break up the DeRozan-Levine one-two punch. And, you know, one of those two will probably be traded elsewhere to try to bring in more size and more three-point shooting to this team. Does that mean there could be a rebuild or a retool on the fly for next year? Well, I think since they gave Zach Levine a max contract last summer, you know, the five-year deal, I think Zach is going to be around unless they get an incredible offer for him and they decide that he's the one to go and they, and they, they decide to keep DeMar DeRozan instead. But I think it's much more likely that DeRozan is traded for either draft picks and or players to try to really – give them, uh, like you mentioned, a rebuild on the fly. I don't think 
the anyone in the Bulls organization has the stomach for tearing it down and trying to build it back up again because right now they don't have a lot of draft capital and that's real usually the route that you want to go if you're going to tear it down all the way. I think they feel like there's enough talented pieces on this roster that maybe with some tweaks to the team they can be in a better position next year. But the reality of it is, you know, you've got Milwaukee, Boston, and Philadelphia that are heavyweights in the East. They're not going anywhere. Cleveland is only going to get better in the short term. Uh, you know, you've got four teams in the East that are going to really be tough to hurdle in, in the near term. And I think that the organization really has to do some soul searching in their offseason meetings and decide what's the best course to try to not only uh, get into contention status for the short term, but also to maybe look at the next five years and see what moves do we need to make to make sure that we don't sink to the bottom again. Because trying to go to the win, you know, hope for lottery luck and free agency has proven not to be a very successful formula in the NBA. How did the Bulls even get into this situation? AKK, Mandy got rid of pretty much everybody from the Garpax era. And now we sit here today and the Bulls are pretty much in the same spot they were about four years ago. What happened? Well, I think he was, AK was really being praised for all the bold moves he made back in the summer of 21. You remember at the time when they acquired DeMar DeRozan, everyone was amazed that they could get a player, a multiple time all-star to come to Chicago when they hadn't won in several years. That would, that move was really being hailed league wide as was the sign and trade for Lonzo Ball, which happened, you know, right at the start of free agency, which of course cost him a second round draft pick when the league decided they contacted him <laughs> too early. But, you know, both those moves were, were universally loved at the time. The Vucevic trade was loved at the time because, you know, Wendell Carter had been a disappointment since the Bulls drafted him seventh overall back in 2018. So, you know, it looked like they had the makings of a team that was going to be a contender in the East. We all remember what happened at the beginning of last season. They were tied for the top record in the East going into the All-Star break. And then the injuries to Ball and Caruso set them back and they dropped all the way back to the sixth position and were quickly drummed out of the playoffs by Milwaukee. Uh, you know, no one could have foreseen the Lonzo Ball situation being as dire as it has turned out to be. He did have some knee issues, both with the Lakers and with the Pelicans, and maybe should have been some sort of a red flag. But remember, the Bulls acquired him. He was a 24-year-old player who was the number two overall pick, uh, you know, who seemed to fit perfectly with the other pieces that they already had on the roster. And he played exceptionally well in that half a season he was in a Bulls uniform. But now, you know, he just underwent a third surgery on that knee, and no one knows if he'll ever play again, much less play at a, at a high level. How do you evaluate Karnishibis's and Ebers Ebersley's moves so far as uh, president and GM? Well, as I said, I was very uh, positive about the moves they made back in the summer of 21. What they did was they brought in a veteran group that you felt like they could contend immediately in the Eastern Conference, maybe not get all the way to the finals, but a team that could be definitely a playoff squad and maybe even win a round or two. But, you know, because of bad luck and, and not really solidifying some parts of the roster, they've taken a big step back this year. Now the, the challenge for AK and his staff is to try to come up with some moves they can make within the constraints of the way the, the organization is structured to try to make this a better team that's not just fighting for a plan but maybe fighting for, for home court advantage in the first round. I know this might be too soon, Mark, but is there any talk or have you heard anything about Karnishevis being shown the door, being on thin ice after all these things have come to pass? No, I don't think so. I think the, the Bulls were very impressed with him throughout the interview process. Karnishevis is a guy who was very well respected around the league. He got very positive reviews from other people in the uh, front office business. And when he came in, he quickly showed that he wasn't afraid to make bold moves. He turned over the roster completely, as you mentioned. Kobe White and Zach Levine are the only remaining guys from the roster that he inherited. And I and I feel like he he's shown that he's not afraid to make a bold trade. I think after the trade deadline this past season, when he held his news conference, you could see that in his body language, I mean, he kept banging the desk in front of him to emphasize how frustrated he was that he wasn't able to get something done. And I think that had to do with the fact that whatever moves that might have been available to him, he couldn't do because of luxury tax constraints. So I think this summer he'll get a much longer leash in terms of being able to move pieces around and maybe make some bigger moves rather than just trying to make a couple of fringe moves that's really not going to make a big difference to whether this roster can, can just barely squeak into the playoffs. Is there anybody specific you think the Bulls should focus on coming up in free agency? 
It's too early to tell right now, John. A lot of that depends on how these playoffs shake out. You're always going to have a situation where some team gets beat early and frustration comes out and all of a sudden a player you thought wasn't available suddenly is. We've heard some comments out of Boston where Jalen Brown has indicated that, you know, maybe he's not been shown as much love as he would like from the Celtics organization. Let's say, for example, Boston loses in the first or second round. That may become a firestorm instead of a, just a little spark. And all of a sudden, Jalen Brown might become available. Uh, Luka Doncic may, you know, if Dallas misses the playoffs, he may try to force his way out of Dallas. The, you know, you just can't foresee what guys might suddenly become available. And the, and the job of any NBA executive is to make sure that you have the assets in place to make a bold move when it presents itself. A couple other guys who may seek trades. Damian Lillard, you know, Portland, again, was saying they were going to build around him, try to get back into the playoffs. They started out okay this year, but then sunk miserably in the second half where I think they have the fifth worst record in the league right now. And then Bradley Beal out in, with the Wizards. They, they are another underachieving team. So that's four all-stars right there who could become available in trade. Now, I'm not saying the Bulls have the combination of assets, especially with their lack of draft picks to make that type of trade. But I think that AK has shown that, that he's willing to, to really talk about any kind of superstar that might be out there. And, you know, today uh, on April 5th, I don't think we can really foresee who might be available come July 1. Mark, how different is this game compared to when you covered the Jordan era, for example, or even covering this game early in the 2000s? You mentioned all these players who are suddenly could be available, going to be out there. How different is this for you versus 20 years ago? You know, it's funny you ask that question because, you know, on Monday there was no NBA because they take the night off to let the college national championship sure. have the spotlight. And so NBA TV has to run filler programming, you know, just to get through their broadcast day. And they ran a replay of a 1988 game between the Bulls and the Pistons. And I'll tell you what, John, they could have had guys arrested for assault and battery in that game. Guys were getting <laughs> knocked to the ground, hit in the head, you know, taken out on drives to the basket. And they just got up went to the free throw line, shot their free throws, and it was no big deal. Now everything is reviewed to see if it's a flagrant one. Most of them turn out to be flagrant ones. And I'm not saying I'm in favor of guys going out headhunting and trying to injure players, but I think we've taken a lot of the physicality out of the modern game. We don't see many back-to-the-basket scores anymore. I mean, even your big, big, uh, prolific big men like Joel Embiid, he gets a lot of his points shooting 17-foot jump shots. And he can make three-pointers as well. He had 52 the other night in their win over Boston. So you, you're not seeing the back-to-the-basket center. You're not seeing as much physical play. Uh, the three-point shot rule scoring is way up. It is, a, it is a completely different game. It's entertaining. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I love watching when Steph Curry gets hot and is making three-pointers from 35 feet. It's fun to watch. But at times, teams get into the trap of thinking that just because the other team is making threes, we have to do that too. And, you know, the Bulls, I believe, were like 7 for 32 yesterday from the three-point line. Hey, if they're not going in, try something different. I know I know, my friend Stacey King was talking about in the broadcast yesterday when uh, Vooch got a couple of low-post buckets. He said, just do that more often. You know, he says, I'm, I'm tired of saying this on every broadcast. They should go <laughs> inside of the big man and get some easy baskets instead of shooting and missing so many three-point shots. How do you like watching today's game? Is it more entertaining or when you compare maybe the 90s, the Bulls, the Jordan years, which era would you prefer? You know, I think all eras have their appeal. Um, sure. You know, when I first started watching basketball when I was a kid, that was the uh, the Will Chamberlain, Bill Russell era. And, you know, you only had eight, 12 teams in the league. And it was the same. You'd see the same games on TV all the time, generally. You'd have Boston against Philadelphia with Russell against Wilt playing, you know, 12 times a year. Um, so, there, you know, that wasn't great because the Celtics were winning all those championships and there really wasn't a lot of competition. There were only a couple of teams that even could come close to competing with him. Then you went into the 70s and, you know, I, I, there, there was a lot of good teams or a lot of different teams that, that had a chance to win championships. And then you got into the 80s and it was the bird and magic era and it was the Celtics Lakers in the finals every year. So, you know, every era, it seems like there's been a, a few teams that have stood out above the rest. It's a game that's really kind of lended itself to teams making kind of dynastic runs, which we've seen with Golden State over the last half decade. And I don't know whether that's necessarily good or bad. I, I would like to see, uh, you know, some teams maybe try to go away from always having to go with small ball lineups and shooting threes. I mean, Billy Donovan right now, most nights, 
has four guards on the floor with a center, you know, for most of the game. And, you know, when you've got Alex Caruso at 6'3 or 6'4 trying to guard LeBron or Giannis, it, it's, it's not much fun to watch because you're just giving up way too much size. What do you expect the Bulls to do this year, assuming they now make the play in tournament and face whoever they will in this first round? Yeah, well, they've already clinched that play in. And they're pretty much locked into that 10 slot. So they'll pro- they'll either go to Toronto or Atlanta for that first game. And I, my guess is that it'll probably be Toronto because they have a tough schedule. Their last three games, they play two in Boston, and then they play Milwaukee the last game of the year. Although Milwaukee may sit there, guys, the last game if they have everything clinched. But, you know, if they go to Toronto, I, I you know, I don't give them much of a chance because Toronto is a bad matchup for the Bulls. We've seen that during the season when the Raptors won two out of three, they have a team that has a lot of size. They have a lot of switchable guys that are six, seven to six, nine, and the Bulls don't match up very well. So, you know, it's a one game situation. It's like the NCAA tournament one and done. So I'm I'm certainly not discounting their chances to have a good shooting night and and to go into Toronto and win, but just looking at the matchup on paper and what we've seen throughout the course of the regular season, the odds would tell you that most likely they'll lose in Toronto and and then then it's on to the off season. Should we should we celebrate a Bulls play-in tournament victory? Is this something we should be propping up if they win it and move on to the next round? Uh, I, no, celebrate, no, <laughs> definitely not. I mean, after what they did last year, winning 46 games, being the sixth seed in the East, even after a late-season slump, the expectations were so much higher. Arturo said as much when he said, we, we expect to do better than we did last season, which would indicate at least winning one playoff round. And unfortunately, because of a combination of injuries and some guys not playing as well as expected, they've struggled with inconsistency throughout the year. And, you know, if he's going to try to run it back, I I don't think that's going to be looked upon very favorably by the fan base because Lonzo Ball is going to miss most, if not all, of next season. They're going to have to find a point guard. I know there's been some sentiment in some areas of the media and the fan base that maybe Kobe White can be the starting point guard next year. And maybe that is the route they go. He has improved his ball handling. I think his decision-making is a lot sounder than it was when he came into the league as a 19-year-old. But whether or not he can be an impact point guard on a team that you hope to go deep into the playoffs, that remains to be seen. What about Patrick Williams, too? I mean, this was supposed to be a prove-it year for him. I don't think he's proven too much yet. Yeah, I've been disappointed, by and large, with what we've seen with from Patrick in year three. You know, last year he was hurt. He missed most of the season. And, and I, I certainly understand that, you know, that kind of set back his development. But it's just, you know, this whole competitive mindset. A lot of times he drifts in games. And for a guy who was the fourth overall pick in the draft, a guy who everyone would, would say has the uh, ideal size to be an impact three and D type of wing, you know, too often he just doesn't make an impact in games. Now, granted, he's playing with three guys who – our former all-stars in, in DeRozan, Levine, and Vucevic. And, you know, he's, he's a young guy who probably feels like he has to defer to them. But yet there are times in games where he'll catch the ball on the perimeter and he won't even look at the basket. You know, he'll just swing it around to the next passing lane available. And, and I think for a guy that was drafted that highly, I think that he should have more of an impact on the game. Now, he's only 22. Maybe in, in years to come, we will see that. But when you get to the point, you get to your fourth or fifth year in the NBA, then you're talking about significant dollars that you have to reinvest to, to sign a guy. And to this point, he hasn't shown enough to consider signing him to some kind of a you know long-term contract at really high dollars. You make a great point about Williams, and this brought up an idea for me of Lowry marketing. Can you explain to me what's happened to him this past year? I mean, it seems like the Bulls now kind of struck out on him when a few years ago it was quite the opposite. Well, unfortunately, when Lowry came in here, you know, he showed some flashes of being a really good player, but he was hurt. He was hurt so many times during his Bulls career. And then the last season with uh, Billy Donovan, they kind of went away from him. You know, they had just drafted Patrick Williams and they tried to have Lowry play small forward at seven feet. And that really wasn't working out too well. I mean, he was he was asked a lot of times to just stand in the corner and wait for the ball to swing to him. And then he lost his uh, starting job when they made the Vucevic trade. And I think You know, he kind of felt like the front office and the coaching staff didn't really value him. So when it came time for him to go into restricted free agency, he he told the front office, you know, if I don't have a meaningful role here, why don't you go ahead and trade me? 
They made that three-way deal with uh, Cleveland and Portland to move him along. Vucevic, or excuse me, Markkanen had a good year in Cleveland, and then he was moved along to Utah in that huge trade for Donovan Mitchell, which really worked out for both sides because, you know, Donovan Mitchell's been fantastic for the Cavs, and, and Markkanen is an all-star in Utah, and they get all those draft picks from Cleveland in exchange. But I think with Lowry, again, it was a guy drafted into the league at 19 years old, um, you know, he got married at a young age. He had a child, he and his wife, and he had a lot of life things going on. He was hurt a lot. And I, I just think by the time he got to his fourth year in Chicago and his role was de-emphasized, you know, he didn't know which way to turn. So, you know, getting a new fresh start first in Cleveland and then in Utah, where they really featured him in the offense, brought out the best of him. I saw a stat the other day where he's the first player ever to make 200 three-point shots and 100 dunks in the same season. And he came into the United Center in one of the games I got a chance to fill in for Adam Amin on the play-by-play. And he had like six or seven dunks, and he was dunking on everybody in the game. Uh, he, he's just, you know, he's, he's come out with a competitive mindset to be very aggressive both in shooting the long ball and in going to the basket. And I think most of the credit on that should go to Lowry Markkinen. And the, while the Bulls should get some blame for not fully developing him, there were a lot of factors also that kind of held Lowry back. Mark Janowski here with us on Sports Talk Chicago. And, Mark, we want to talk some Bears now. What do you make of all these moves so far this offseason for them? I think they're looking very good. Yeah, they've got a long way to go, though, John. You know, when you finish with the worst <laughs> record in the league, you know, you could you could make the argument that they may only have four or five core players, and then you're filling in another, you know, 17 to 18 spots on your, on your starting lineups. So they have a long way to go, and I, I give Ryan Poles a lot of credit for filling in a lot of key positions. I really like the two linebackers they signed. I think those guys are going to be impact players immediately. I think they they did a good job in the draft last year, picking up a starting corner and a starting safety that I think are going to be good players for them for a lot of years to come. They didn't really address their questions on the offensive line, but hopefully they can still do that either later in free agency or with some of those high picks that they have in the upcoming draft. But I think they're off to a, a really good start. I think the DJ Moore acquisition – is really kind of underrated at this point. I mean, here you got a 25-year-old guy who put up great numbers with the Carolina Panthers. I don't know if he's exactly a number one receiver, but he is a guy that can stretch the field, who put up good numbers with the Panthers. And I think that he'll give Justin Fields a target who can really open up the field and make his job a lot easier. How big of a jump are you expecting for Fields now with all these weapons at his disposal? Well, the key thing, though, John, is they have to solidify that offensive line. Yeah. You know, everyone talked about the fact that he was putting up record numbers running the football, but he was also exposing himself to a lot of big hits. You know, he, he's a strong guy, and he, and he was able to stay in games last year, but there were times where he took a hit, and you're just like, man, I don't know how many more of those he can take. Hopefully, you know, he'll, he'll be more uh, effective passing within the pocket. Um, he'll be a little more patient with a better offensive line and with better receivers to throw to, and he won't have to find himself making the one read, seeing that the offensive protection is crumbling, and then immediately running. Maybe he can give it an extra beat and scan for secondary receivers and maybe hit some plays uh, later in the progressions uh, as he's looking down the field. Do you think his problem was with passing last year was more so an offensive line issue, or was he still trying to learn out the position? Was it a combination of both? What do you think about that? I think those those are both factors. I think also that, you know, he needs to improve on his accuracy, especially throwing the intermediate to deep ball. And that's something that he was very candid in talking about at the end of the season when he met the media that, you know, he wasn't he's not a guy who's ever going to point fingers at his teammate. He's never going to say, well, I didn't have enough time to look down the field or, or, or scan for second or third targets. Uh, you know, I think he realizes that he, he missed some guys. He threw the ball high at times. He does need to improve his accuracy, but I think with better receivers, with a guy like DJ Moore who can stretch the field, and hopefully by getting that extra second with better offensive line protection, you'll see him improving in all those areas. Do you have any expectations or at least baseline expectations for Fields this year? Well, I think his passing numbers are going to jump dramatically. I think you're going to see him go into the mid-60% range in terms of completion percentage. I think his passing yardage is going to jump up dramatically. Um, you know, his interceptions, I think, will will probably stay around where they were this year. But I don't think, you know, I think you're going to see the big jump in, in touchdown into interception, so his ratio will be that much better. I think you're going to see a huge jump from Justin Fields in year three, and, and I think 
the whole Bears offense is going to look a lot better. The question is going to be where they're going to fare in a central division that's it's kind of hard to forecast right now. I mean, the Lions came on so strong at the end of the year. Uh, they've got a couple of first-round draft picks to use. I think the Lions are probably going to be the favorite going into this season. Minnesota coming off a really good year last year, but I think a lot of that was a little bit of a smoke and mirrors year because their point differential wasn't really that good despite their record. And Green Bay is likely to take a precipitous fall with Aaron Rodgers leaving town. Do you think he ends up going to the Jets? I know there's been reports, nothing's official yet. Is that where you think he's going to go? Oh, he's gone. They, they've they burned that bridge. <laughs> Not only burned it, they've torpedoed it, whatever, whatever analogy you want to use. There's no way Aaron Rodgers is going back to Green Bay. The Packers front office is completely sick and tired of all the drama. And he didn't play well last year. Now, granted, he fractured his thumb. Uh, and, if, you know, for a quarterback, that's that's just a devastating injury. I'm sure that impacted him on a lot of throws that, that he missed last year. But the Packers are done. They're going to turn it over to Jordan Love. Um, you know, they had a couple of first-round draft picks on the defensive side last year. I think in the short term, they're hoping that an improved defense and a good running game can keep them competitive. But it, it'll be it'll be a couple of years until they know whether or not Jordan Love is, is going to be a quarterback who can keep them competitive in the NFC North. Do you think it's going to be Lions, at least right now, at number one? Why do you say that? Well, look at the way they played late in the year. I think they won like seven of their last eight, something like that. They were they were remarkable late in the year. Uh, if you watch the Hard Knocks series on HBO, Dan Campbell is a magnetic personality <laughs> as a head coach. I think his guys love playing for him. Aaron Glenn, their defensive coordinator, also a guy who uh, carries a lot of respect from the team. I just think it's it's a it's a fun coaching staff that really got the most out of their players. Jared Goff quietly had a really good year last season. You know, the Rams gave up on him, and it paid off, you know, in terms of winning a Super Bowl with Matthew Stafford, but then the Rams took a big step backwards last year. They got their one Super Bowl, so I'm sure they're, they're happy with the trade. But, you know, I think the Lions, they added David Montgomery uh, from the Bears as a guy who's, who's going to be a factor in the running game. Uh, their their defense is only going to be better next year. I think that they're probably the favorite, Minnesota 1A, and, and I think that, uh, you know, the Bears, I think they need to take a, a step, an intermediate step. My, my goal, if I was, would be Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus, is finish around 500, 8 and 9, 9 and 8. I think that'd be a very successful season. What did you think about the David Montgomery move? I read a report last week that, the main difference maker was in year two of the contract, Detroit offered him more guaranteed money than the Bears. But what do you make of those details and then Montgomery leaving Chicago? Yeah, I think it just falls in line with what we've seen about the devaluation of the running back position in the NFL. I mean, most of the time I watch football, the running back was king. You know, you always right. teams would would do almost anything to get an elite workhorse running back that they could use both on the ground and in the passing game. And when you had one, you just hung on to him. You valued him for dear life, and you just used him over and over and over again. And now they look at it as, you know, almost like uh, disposable socks or something. They just, you know, <laughs> get your wear out of him and you throw him away. Uh, they're, most teams are just happy to take a running back in the fourth, fifth, or sixth round, use him for three or four years, and say, all right, well, we'll, we'll bring in a young guy at low money. We'll, we'll let him get pounded for a few years, and then, and then we'll move on. You see very few running backs – that last eight, nine, ten years. Look what's happened to Ezekiel Elliott in Dallas. He was devalued the last couple of years. Granted, he had some injuries, but right now they just cut him, and he's getting very little interest on the free agent market because they look at him as a guy that at age 29 or 30 is basically finished. Yeah, I find that so fascinating. I mean, as you mentioned, you followed Chicago sports forever. Walter Payton. Yeah, a night and day difference between the running back situation of today or even guys like Emmett Smith, Barry Sanders. It's a much different sport when it comes to running backs today than it was that back then. Yeah, and you look at so many great running backs of the past, they were featured in just about everything that a team would do. Now you're going to have a different running back on first and second down as you're going to have on third down. <laughs> you'll, you'll go to multiple wide receivers, and if you have a guy who's a good receiver as a running back, who maybe can get open on a wheel route or get down the field a little bit, then you'll use him. Otherwise, a lot of teams will go with no running backs on third down. So the, the offensive structures have changed so much in the last five to ten years that the running back position ha has become so devalued that teams don't want to invest big dollars. That's why, you know, Saquon Barkley, you know, there was talk about would the Giants resign him. 
he knew that he wasn't going to have a big market in free agency, so there really weren't a lot of options for him. Do you trust in Khalil Herbert to take on this bigger load now that Montgomery's gone? I think he'll be the the starter, but that's not to say that they won't bring in another guy, whether it's one of the later rounds of the draft or later in free agency. I think I saw a figure last week that the Bears still have something like $38 million available to spend. So they they can still go out and add somebody in free agency. I mean, you know, if they wanted a short yardage back, they could potentially take a flyer on Ezekiel Elliott as a, as a goal line, you know, short yardage back if they wanted to do something like that. Um, I, I don't think that's likely. I don't think, you know, because he has been kind of pouty at times when he doesn't get his touches. So I don't think with a young team on, you know, on the rise, I don't think they're going to want to bring in a lot of veterans who might not be happy in a limited role. I think more likely they'll bring in a guy that, uh, you know, they can use as a as either a third down back or a guy who's happy with limited touches. You know, they did bring in a running back from Seattle who's more of a special teams guy, but that, that's the kind of thing they'll be looking at to, to supplement Herbert. Mark Janowski is still with us on Sports Talk Chicago. Mark, a few more questions before we finish up. I uh, wanted to ask you about the Windy City Bowl season over. First year doing full-time play-by-play. How'd it go? It was a blast. It was a really fun season. And I'm sure you saw the news today that Carly Jones was named the uh, G League Most Valuable Player, and he really deserved it. He led the league in scoring. He was really a dynamic player, and he was the driving force and then making a huge run over the last two months. They wound up missing a playoff spot than a tiebreaker. It was really frustrating because they finished their season a couple of days before some other teams, and they only needed one thing to break right for them, and everything broke wrong in the last two <laughs> days, and, and they lost the playoff spot and the tiebreaker. The, the G League playoffs are fascinating because they get them done in a hurry. It, it is like the NCAA tournament. It's one and done, and right now they're in the uh, finals that are going to wrap up on Sunday where that's the best two out of three. But getting a chance to call the home games on NBC Sports Chicago was a blast. It was something that, that I always aspired to do. And, you know, the, the season flew by. It was, a, it was a great group of guys. And the Bulls parent organization did a nice job in making sure that, you know, they made players available. Uh, Marco Simonovic uh, was available all year long as an assignment player. Dale and Terry played about a half dozen games as a first-round draft pick. Remember, Carly Jones signed a standard NBA contract uh, back in February. And they let him finish out the season with with Windy City. So they had a a good roster uh, throughout the year. They were fun to watch. They played their best basketball late in the year. Uh, It's just a shame they didn't get a chance in the playoffs. But, you know, I'm already looking forward to next year and and seeing if uh, they can make a run to a playoff spot next year. What was the best part about broadcasting those games for you? Just the immediacy of it. You know, there's nothing like a live event. You know, most of my career, I was talking about events either previewing something or talking about it in the past tense. There's nothing quite like the assign, uh, you know, the, the excitement of a live event. I know you do a lot of play-by-play, John, and, and you know, there's, there's nothing quite like it. I mean, the preparation leading up to the event is an important part of being successful. And then just getting kind of wrapped up in, in the excitement of what you're witnessing. You know, they're, they're, broadcasting is great in general. I, I, you know, I've had a wonderful career, and I'm very grateful for every moment of it. But, you know, those times doing play-by-play, those two hours, two and a half hours just flew by. And, and when you got done, you know, you really felt like you, like you accomplished something. Not to say you didn't in other areas, but it's, it's, it's not the same feeling. And that's something that I, I'm very grateful I got a chance to experience late in my career. Is there going to be more play-by-play in your future for other teams or other organizations? Uh, that remains to be seen. Um, I haven't really made any uh, inquiries into other positions at this point. You know, I got a chance to fill in for Adam Amin for four Bulls games this year. Um, Generally, he has some conflicts during the NFL season when he has to be out of town for the entire weekend, both doing prep meetings and then doing the game itself on Fox. So, you know, my hope is that, you know, I might get a chance to do three or four games next year. But between that and doing the, the 24 Windy City games, that's not bad. So, you know, I'm not necessarily going to pursue more opportunities, but if something presents itself, I certainly would, wouldn't say no. What do you prefer? This is a big question. What do you prefer, play-by-play or studio work? Going to put you on the spot. Well, at this point, you know, definitely play-by-play because, you know, as we've talked about in the past, when I first got into the business, that's what I wanted to do, but circumstances led me towards the studio work, and I had a great run with it. I, I enjoyed it. 
immensely and I had some great experiences that, that, I'll, that I'll always treasure. But this is what I always wanted to do and getting the chance to experience it has been very gratifying. And, you know, people always talk about, you know, bucket list things that you get a chance to achieve. And this is definitely, that was one of my bucket lists. And I'm very happy that it, it wasn't just a, a once only thing. It was something I got a chance to do now for a couple of years and hopefully several more years in the future. I wanted to ask you too about the Give Me the Hot Sauce podcast. You guys are growing on YouTube. You're partnered with Odyssey. How's that been going? Uh, it's been a lot of fun. You know, uh, Stacy is amazing. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've been uh, just overwhelmed by his ability to come in with a lot of energy every show, regardless of his travel schedule. You know, he always wants to do the show in person rather than just do it through a through a Zoom hookup or some kind of internet hookup. He wants to be in person so that you can really enjoy the interaction. You can give each other grief and you can, you know, you're not stepping on each other when you're talking about various topics. And, and I, and I give him a ton of credit for it. I mean, people who've listened to the show know what a great sense of humor he has, what a great storyteller he is. And, you know, we, the big challenge on, on any podcast or any show like you're doing is, is to make sure that you're constantly coming up with new and interesting guests. Um, you know, we've we've partnered with Odyssey and, and we've we've gotten some some really good guests in recent months. And we're going to try to continue that going on into the summer. And, and I think that's really going to be the, the big test for us is to keep the show fresh, to keep it uh, you know interesting and make sure that we're offering uh, A-list guests for our, for our audience. You're one of my favorite guests, Mark. Not blowing well, smoke. I'm being that, honest. Man. That's true. <laughs> you are one of my favorites. Very kind of you to say so. <laughs> Before we finish up today, last question. Who was your favorite basketball player growing up? Uh, my favorite player when I was a kid was, hmm, that's an that's interesting one. Well, I, you know, when I was a kid was when the uh, Milwaukee Bucks franchise first started. So obviously that was when uh, Lou Alcindor was drafted out of UCLA. And getting a chance to watch him play the first seven years of his career in Milwaukee was pretty remarkable, but you know, there's so many players that, that, I, that I've enjoyed watching through the years. I loved watching magic Johnson play a six, nine point guard, the joy with which he played the game, the great rivalry with Larry bird. That was so much fun. I like the guy that, you know, Chicago fans are very familiar with in, in Sidney Moncrief. He played with the Milwaukee bucks in the eighties and, and Michael Jordan said he was one of the toughest defenders that he had to go up against. My grief was a guy who had some knee issues that kind of shortened his career, but he was an NBA two-time defensive player of the year. He was a multiple-time all-star, and, and he was a guy that, that left it on the court, you know, each and every night. I love watching uh, Jordan, obviously. I mean, Jordan was the best, the greatest of all time. And then Bulls fans were blessed to have Derrick Rose. It, unfortunately, it was, a, it was a short period for him to be at the top of his game and at the top of the league, but there was nothing quite like those first – three or four years of Derrick Rose. I mean, he was flying above the rim and, and just doing remarkable things. So, you know, I've been blessed both as a fan and as a broadcaster to witness some of the greatest players of all time. And, you know, it's tough to come up with uh, a list of the greatest players ever, but those those are the ones that really stood out to me as guys that, that really uh, that I, I wanted to watch every time they took the floor. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining me. Such great insights tonight. You know, I see a comment there saying Mark Shanowski is the Google of Chicago sports. And I firmly agree with that <laughs> statement. I appreciate all your time. I wish you the best, obviously with Windy City, with give me the hot sauce with ABC seven. And I'm looking forward to the next time we chat as well. Thanks, John. I appreciate you having me on. And, and hopefully AK can come up with the right combination of moves to get the bulls back into a, a contending status next year, at least to get past the first round of the playoffs. I, I know that he is personally stung by, you know, some of the things that have happened, some of them out of the control, namely the Lonzo Ball situation. But, you know, for Bulls fans, I think he's going to go out and be really bold this summer. So so stay tuned. I think there's going to be some very interesting moves made in the offseason. I want a happier conversation with you. Every time you come on, we're talking about bad things or unfortunate things that are happening with the Bulls. So I hope to see that happen, too. That'll be nice. Yeah, and, and like I said, I think the Bears are on the rise. So we've got, yes. some, we've got some things going. The Bears <laughs> are on the rise. I think the Cubs are on the rise. And we'll, we'll see what, what the White Sox are going to look like this year. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. Thanks, John.
Mark Janowski with us here on Sports Talk Chicago. Great interview. Uh, if you missed any of it, go back and listen to the podcast form of the show. We are on Apple, Spotify. We're also on YouTube. You can watch the clips going up tomorrow. We're on TuneIn. We're also on iHeart and Odyssey. John Meadows here directing and producing. We're presented by our good sponsors, Amish Country Farms, for the best Amish food in all of Chicagoland. Head up Amish Country Farms today in Orland Park. Pie order forms closing soon. Give them a call or head on in and make sure you get your pie ready fresh from the Amish of Northern Indiana. You can find us everywhere. Twitter, at John Z Sports, Facebook, John Zaglul. Also, Sports Talk Chicago. We're live on Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube at all those places as well. Uh, just want to say thank you to everybody for tuning in here tonight. Mark had some great insights on the Bulls, on the Bears, and what both teams could be looking like in the years to come. And I'm sure that as the Bulls get going after this playoff run and then into the offseason, we're going to have him on again to talk about all those things. And as he said there near the end, he teased us a bit. Could be some moves coming up. There could be some moves for the Bulls this summer. That's going to be something we're going to watch closely. Uh, stay with us throughout the week. We have a new show coming at you Sunday as well. More opinions, more analysis, more Cubs, White Sox, Bulls, and Bears. Thank you to John Meadows for directing and producing. And for all of you for tuning in here tonight, Until next time, so long, everyone.